Hey everybody, Nick here, and today I got a review for you of these three knives right here. These are a trio of knives by Camillus, the sizzle, the wildfire, and the heat. Oh boy, it's getting hot in here. But uh, anyways, <laughs> um, thank you very much first off to my buddy Sean for sending these three along together. Uh, that was actually a beautiful thing and uh, worked out really nicely. Next thing, Camillus Knives. Many of you guys may remember Camillus Knives as being an American-made knife brand, and that used to be true. In fact, they were the oldest knife brand in the U.S. Thing is, Camillus Knives was killed off in 2007, largely due to uh, competition from overseas markets. But uh, the brand name was purchased, there were like three years where Camillus this wasn't a thing. Then the brand name was purchased in 2009 by a huge consortium, Acme United, which brought the brand back from the dead. Um, and at this point, this new company, Zombie Camillus, if you will, uh, shipped all of their production over to China and began producing new knives using the old name. And these three designs are all by this Zombie Camillus. Um, one of the really interesting things about these knives is that they are all three are designed by Gavin and Grant Hawk, the mad scientists of the knife world. Uh, well, known for the Chris Reeve tie lock, the Hawk Mud, a bunch of other knives out there in the world. Um, and so that's really neat. Let's do a size comparison here real quick. I'll go ahead and take this middle guy out of the way so I can put things in the middle there. Uh, this right here is your Spydeco Delica. And so you can see that in terms of blade length, this is actually right in about the same vicinity here. Um, Spydeco PM2. So again, you're in that same basic area with the bigger guy, the heat. Right here is your Ontario rat number one, and your rat number two, and let's pick something suitably obscure so that uh, people will make fun of that in the future. CKF Tegral. Alrighty, there we go. So let's go ahead and jump into the good, the great, the bad, and the ugly of this trio of knives. Okay, uh, and one other note, uh, I've only got one disassembly video because these three knives are substantially the same thing. The only difference really is in the size. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll comment on the differences where necessary, but I'm doing these as one video because it doesn't, you know, merit multiple videos. Uh, but anyways, let's talk about the good. On the good side, first off, actually, I gotta say, um, the, the construction of these knives, so these are some sort of a plastic right here. Uh, it looks like, it's textured to look like G10, but it's just some sort of thermoplastic and then there are these metal inserts. You got one on the side, you got one in the back spacer here, and then one on the side again. And I gotta say, um, it, it's a nice feeling. Um, these all plastic knives can feel very cheapy and unfortunate, but this little bit of metal here does add something interesting and different to it. Uh, so that's kind of nice. Next thing, the ergonomics on these knives are actually pretty good in my versatile hands here. Um, so, you know, this little guy, even for my relatively small hands, I'm not getting a whole bunch of grip on and the big guy starts to feel a little unwieldy but honestly the design overall i mean it's got plenty of groove you got a nice thumb ramp down here this feels pretty good in the hand overall i think these are good ergonomic pieces so that's good next thing um this is a little detail here but if we look at the back spacer in here you can see that there's sort of a groove cut out in there and this is a beautiful thing it's something that shouldn't be necessary but i uh, what this likely means is that they wanted to make sure that even in the event that they were a little bit out of tolerance the blade was not going to hit the inside of the backspace or in dull the blade and hurt the backspace. That's one of those little conscientious moves uh, that I, I really do respect and appreciate. Um, next thing. These knives are actually running on bearings, which is kind of unusual at these lower price points, but uh, the action on them as a result is very good. We'll talk more about the action in a little bit here, but uh, the, the bearingness of them is very palpable and is very nice. Next thing, backspacer. Each one of these knives has this metallic backspacer here, and you can see it's actually pretty well done. It's not just a, uh, like had they just done this as a piece of metal sticking out, these would have been really sharp, but you see there's a, uh, there's a nice chamfer here on both sides that make this grippy but not like painful and so that that's a surprisingly nice detail they got going on there the uh next thing about this guy is you saw in the disassembly you really should watch the disassembly on these knives more than most because that'll tell you a lot more but this little piece right here is a uh this is a torx screw and uh that actually controls you can see there's a little ball inside there and that controls the lockup on this guy so if you get any vertical blade play you can adjust that until it goes away um and so i like the fact that you're able to do that and it makes it so that even if things aren't really put well together from the factory you can always change that later on 
Next thing, get three size choices here. You get the sizzle, which is 2.75 inches of blade, the wildfire at three inches, and the heat at three and a half. I think this is a beautiful thing because it means that no matter your local laws and your preferences for carry, uh, there's one of you, one of these guys is going to work out for you. And honestly, at some level, I wish more people did this. It happens on occasion. You get like the Spyderco Para 3 and PM2, but very, very seldom do you have a choice of the same design in a couple of different sizes. And I think they've done it well. So that's really nice. The prices on these guys are relatively good. Um, you're looking at 40 bucks across the board. I mean, you know, plus or minus a buck or two. And so that's not a bad price. Um, whether the knife, it's, but I, I, it's a, it's a budget minded sort of price. Uh, you'll, you'll hear more about that eh, a little bit later, but still. And then finally, I gotta say, I love the flipper tabs on these knives because they are, uh, it's unconventional. Most of the time your flipper tab is going to be someplace out here, sticking out the back of it. And uh, this is a very different thing. Instead, f to flip this guy, you reach forward with your index finger and pull it back. And it works beautifully. Um, it's a lot of fun to use, but it also is completely, it's not sticking out, it's not out in your pocket, it's not a pocket pecker, it's just kind of, it's just there. And so I really hope more makers move to this kind of front-mounted flipper tab. That is a beautiful thing. So um, for me, that's the good here. Flip it that positioning is great. Prices are actually pretty reasonable value. I love the size choices here. The adjustable stop pin does make for an easier adjustment there. Nicely done backspacer. It's running on bearings. Groove backspacer allows for lower tolerances without hitting the backspacer. Good ergos and the metal inserts are a nice touch. Let's talk about what's great here. For me, 100%, what is great about this knife is the lock. This is a, uh, a toggle lock that's designed by the, the, the Hawks, basically, and the way that it works is as follows. In the closed position, this little guy, this tab, is right in the center there. And you have two ways to deploy the knife. The first one is actually to pull this back, which will pop the blade about halfway out. And then, if you want, you can use just a little tiny wrist to uh, pop it the rest of the way open. It doesn't pop it all the way open, or else it would be an automatic knife, and that's a little bit sketchier by some laws. I'm not saying that, but some laws define it as if you can't, if you don't have to touch the blade, it's an auto. But anyway, so you can do that, or you can just use the flipper tab. So that's fine. And then to close the knife, all you need to do is pull this little guy back, and it brings the knife back into position. And so, effectively, closing it is just a single motion like that, and the knife is closed. This is not, you know, the most hard use lock, and you can see the details of how it works in the disassembly video, but you know what? It absolutely does the trick. There's no question of lockup with these guys, at least in lighter use here. It's easy to open. It's easy to close. The, it's got a nice detent to it, partly because of that external detent ball there, and it's just a very fidget-friendly lock. I found myself, more so than a lot of knives on my table, you know, sitting there, if I'm watching code compile, just flicking these guys back and forth, because you know what? It's a lot of fun to do that. I mean, it's uh, it's completely not dangerous. Your fingers are not in the slicing path at any point here as you're opening and closing it. It's just, it's a fun little lock. And it's also really unusual because there are so many damn titanium frame locks out in the world these days, not picking on this guy specifically, but all of them, that to see a nicely done weird little toggle lock is a breath of fresh freaking air. And to be able to get a weird lock at an inexpensive price is kind of nice in and of itself. So to me, that is absolutely what is great about this lock, is that it is a fairly compelling lock in a bunch of different ways, and it's available at a pretty steep discount relative to everything else. So uh, there you go. That's what's great is this weird lock. Um, let's talk about what's bad here. Okay, first thing, the names on these knives make zero freaking sense because the small one is called the sizzle, the medium one's the wildfire, and the big one's the heat. But the thing is, this is a continuum. You start off with a little bit of heat that produces a sizzle, and then you keep sizzling and sizzling and sizzling, and eventually it becomes a wildfire. This would make perfect freaking sense, but nope, they just rolled the freaking dice and assigned names that way. This is not making any sense. This is like having these little knives be named the freaking Glacier, the, you know, Ice Cube, and the Honey, it's a little bit cold outside, you should grab a jacket. There is an order to these things, and you should have followed it. I know you don't speak English over there, Camillus, but come on, man. You need to do a little better than that. Next thing. Um, and that was a huge nitpick, but I got a lot of those. Um, <laughs> the uh, lock on these guys is a little bit finicky. Uh, and this is getting into a much more uh, reasonable complaint. 
as you saw, the lock relies on a bunch of little toggles being on the proper areas. That's that's not really a stellar thing, and I suspect that if you drop this guy, it would be pretty easy for one of those little pieces to slide off of its post, uh, you know, to have, especially the one that's holding the, uh, the onto the blade here. I can see that popping loose, and then at that point, you wouldn't be able to close the knife at all. Uh, which would be pretty ugly because you'd have to get your thing out there. And so I'd like to see that better secured. And overall, it doesn't seem like a terribly strong lock as it's been executed there. That spring makes me a little concerned. Mind you, I think most people don't need locks even as strong as this one. I mean, the cold steel cutting demos aside, every lock is probably strong enough for 99% of people. And if you have the other 1%, get a freaking fixed blade. But anyways, not super in love with the uh, strength of these locks here. Next thing. These are kind of a pain to take apart. You saw that in the disassembly. I'm not going to belabor it, but, uh, yeah, especially with things just sitting on top. Ugh. Anyways, moving along. The adjustable stop pins on these guys, like I said, I think at some level that is a beautiful thing. You can see here, there you go. But the problem is anything that you adjust can come out of adjustment. And that can mean on this knife, as you saw in the disassembly, that either the knife won't lock up if it goes too far out this direction, or it will have huge blade blade if it goes too far this direction. And so I tend to, although a lot of people have tried this before, I tend to recommend against it because generally it's better to get the, the lock up right and then set it in stone or titanium as it may be. So there you go. Um, next thing, the uh, screws on the inside. Uh, they, they've got T5 screws. No, I'm sorry, this is not a screw, this is a crime. A T5 is just way too damn small because they tend to strip it. it, it, it just, no, 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 no T5. T6, barely, no T5. Next thing, tip down only carry. Um, look... I feel a little better about it on this knife than most because there's not the flipper tab in the back here and the, 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 this lock, yeah, it's okay, I guess. And a lot of people like tip down, but I really do like having the option here and I think this would be a more compelling knife with it. That could be personal bias and like I said, with the flipper tab being up here, it's less of a major concern, but it is still something I'm not a big fan of. Um, The steel on this guy is okay. It's OS 8 for all three of them and OS 8 is... Fine, I guess. That's the highest praise I can muster. You know, it'll sharpen up. It'll take a decent edge. It'll lose the edge relatively quickly. Eh, whatever. Um, so there you go. Fit and finish on the whole here isn't so swinging, I'll say that. And, uh, that, that, that's, that's, it's just not great. And then finally, particularly for the big guy, this is a very thick knife. You can see this is thicker than your Ontario Rat 1, which is a very thick knife. This is thicker than your Spyderco PM2, which is also a very thick knife. In fact, this is the thickest knife of any knives on my table right now. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And that's, uh, well, that's not super stellar, and especially given the fact that this tip-up carry keeps the wide part closest to the top of the pocket. Uh, it's not so stellar to carry in that way, and it's not super lightweight either. I mean, this big guy here is uh, coming in at, oh, come on now. Big guy comes in at 5.37, medium guy comes in at 4.47, little guy comes in at 3.64 ounces. Each of those are a little bit heavy, uh, and so that's something you got to keep in mind, and that's the bat overall. They are uh, very thick, a little bit heavy, so not stellar for EDC. The fit and finish ain't so great, but it's a Chinese-made Camillus. What do you want? Tip down only carry, OS8 steel, T5 interior screws. No, no, no. Um, It's got the adjustable stop pin, which is kind of a pain. Uh, the steel's okay, I guess. I think I mentioned that already. And uh, then the names don't make a bit of freaking sense. Uh, there you go. Let's talk about what's ugly here. So on the ugly side, unfortunately, uh, first off, they completely screwed up the sharpening joil on all three of these. You can see here the plunge comes out to about here, and uh, the sharpening choil is just this little tiny vestigial choil down here, and that's that's just no freaking good. So you get this unsharpened area down there. They just needed to put that out there more. That's that's just no. You did the bad, bad. But the uglier thing is that this was terribly adjusted from the factory. All three of these knives came from the factory with strong vertical and horizontal blade play. After I took them apart, all three of them no longer do have strong vertical and horizontal blade play. I adjusted those stop pins, which they just did not do, I don't think, and I adjusted the tension of the pivot, and they're all now running great, but that just means that they could have been running great from the factory, but the factory didn't give a damn. And what this means is that if you get this out of the box, this is going to be a terrible knife until you make it okay.
I mean, it's nice that you can get it there, but still, that is so lazy. Uh, the fact that you don't even care enough to make the knife uh, good to go ahead of time. And if they, if it's so bad out of adjustment, the knife won't even lock up. Terrible. I know they got to make a bunch of them quickly, but that's really, really lazy, and it's a travesty to the design here. And so that, to me, is what's ugly, is that they come from the factory with terrible adjustment, and they completely botch the sharpening choil. Let's talk about the final conclusions here. Look, final conclusions, filmed later, hence the lighting change, is that, um... Well, this knife is kind of a shame. I get the impression that the folks at Zombie Camillus were sitting down trying to think, okay, how are we going to make the knife guys love us again? How are we going to make them forget that, you know, all this has happened? And let's, I know, let's go with the, for a big-name collaboration. Let's get, well, reach out to the Hawks. Why not? And, you know, the end result is neat, but also kind of a shame. Let's use an analogy. Imagine that Gordon Ramsay, the big-name celebrity chef, sits down, writes up this beautiful one-off recipe, lists all the ingredients, needed for this wonderful gourmet meal, and then hands it to me, Nick Shabazz, a food incompetent jackass who can only barely cook grilled cheese and has in the past screwed up microwave popcorn. Sure, using this recipe, I will probably make something that kind of resembles the recipe. Uh, it'll definitely taste better than if I tried to do it myself entirely, uh, and it might even be edible. But nonetheless, the prevailing sentiment around that table is going to be roughly... Uh, that's kind of a waste. And I kind of feel that way about this knife here. The, the Hawks dropped a spectacular design in the lap of Zombie Camillus here. It is a great lock. There, there is a great tab here. There's good geometry, good ergos. I mean, overall, this is a very nice knife. Except the factory wasn't able to do it right. They weren't able to let it shine. They used so-so materials, poor fit and finish. It ended up overly thick. It's at a price point that didn't let them do it right. And they didn't even do what they did right. I mean, the, the, the factory just didn't do these properly. Because if you buy one, you're going to need to tune it up in order to make it worth a damn. In order to make it the knife, it even has the opportunity to be right now. And so the end result of this collaboration is a knife that I can't really say is very good, despite having an excellent freaking design. Uh, but the thing is, even having said that, despite the knife not being very good, it is still very neat. Because once you put in the effort, once you tune it up, it, there is some niceness here. It's got a nice lock. The design is pretty cool. It's a lot of fun to play with, and it's a way to experience the work of some high, high-end designers without shelling out hundreds of bucks for a mid-tech from somebody else. And, you know, in a room full of horses, um, there is something to be said for a zebra, even if it is leaning a little funny to one side. Um, this is a weird knife, and that can be a joy. And so I can see a collector picking one of these guys up because it is weird, because it is a zebra. Particularly if you can get it on clearance or something, it is a fun little curiosity. It is a fun little knife to play with, and it's a great inexpensive way to add something completely out of left field to your collection. But, you know, that said, I think for 99% of the knife guys out there, or frankly, if you're just looking for a functional pocket knife, this is probably going to be a pass for you. It's not a great everyday carry choice because of some of these weaknesses in execution. And that price point, 40 bucks, can get you something that is way less unique, but a lot more functional. I mean, I always send people towards, like, the Ontario Rat number two or, or uh, one like that. I, there, there were a lot of great choices here. And, you know, at the end of the day, you have kind of an awkward choice. The, the question is whether you want, well, to use the analogy, a Gordon Ramsay meal that's been prepared by Nick Shabazz, or whether you want a sandwich that's a little more simple but is made by somebody who can actually cook. And in that case, you know, if you want a great design that's not done all that well, this is a great choice. But frankly, I'd recommend you go for a simple thing that's brilliantly executed. So, Camillus, I applaud you reaching out to a big-name designer. I applaud you trying something a little bit weird. Uh, but next time, I hope you put a little bit more effort into the execution, because unfortunately, this one suffered in that way. And everybody else, I hope this has been interesting. It is a really interesting, weird little knife. I kind of like it. I shouldn't like it. But hey, whatever. Ah, uh, and good job there, Hawks. I know you tried. <laughs> Anyways, hope this has been interesting, and uh, I hope this lit a, uh, a wildfire in your heart of, of joy and that you're sizzling with anticipation for the next review and that this made you hot. Okay, that last one was creepy. All right, signing off. Bye now.